doing all this time? He's been gone 20 minutes. Well, haven't you got a cab? No, there's not one to be had for love or money. You really are very helpless, Freddy. Go again and don't come back until you've found a cab. I shall simply get soaked for nothing. And what about us? You selfish pig. Oh, very well. I'll go, I'll go. Sorry. There's manners for you. Two bunches of violets trodden in mud. How do you know that my son's name is Freddy, pray? How is your son, Lizzie? Well, if you'd done your duty by him as a mother, should he know better than to spoil a poor girl's flat and run away without paying? Will you pay me for him? Do nothing of the sort, mother. The idea. Please allow me, Clara. Have you any pennies? No. I have nothing smaller than sixpence. I can give you change for a tanner, kind lady. Well, give it to me. No. This is for your flowers. Ah, uh, thank you kindly, lady. Make her give you the change. These things are only a penny a bun. Do hold your tongue, Clara. Uh, you may keep the change. Thank you, lady. Now, tell me how you know that young gentleman's name. I don't. I heard you call him by it. Don't try and deceive me. I was trying to deceive you. I called him Freddy or Charlie, same as you might yourself if you was talking to a stranger. Wish to be pleasant. Sixpence thrown away. Really, Mama, you might have spared Freddy that. Oh, sir, is there any sign of it stopping? I'm afraid not. It started worse than ever about two minutes ago. Oh, dear. If it's worse, it's a sign it's nearly over. So cheer up, Captain, and buy a flower off a poor girl. I'm sorry, I haven't any change. I can give you change, Captain. A sovereign? I've nothing less. Oh, go on. Do buy a flower off me. I can change off a clown. Here, take this for tuck. Oh, don't be troublesome. There's a good girl. Hang on. Here's three halfpence, if that's any use to you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah you be careful. Give him the flower for it. There's a bloke back here taking down every blessed word you're saying. I ain't done nothing wrong by speaking to gentlemen. I have a right to sell flowers if I keep off the curb. I'm a respectable girl, so help me. I never spoke to him so to ask him by flower. Oh, sir, sir, please don't let him charge me. You don't know what it means to me. They take away me character and drive me in the street for speaking to gentlemen. Who's hurting you, you silly gal? What do you take me for? It's all right. He's a gentleman. Look at his boots. Oh, she thought you was a copper's knock, sir. What's a copper's knock? Well, it's a... Well, it's a copper's knock, isn't it? What else do you call it? A sort of informer. I swear on me Bible, oh, sir. I never said anything to you in Shut up! Shut up. Do I look like a policeman? Then what'd you take down me words for? How do I know whether you took me down right? You just show me what you wrote about me. What's that? Proper writing, I can't read that. I can. Cheer up, Captain, and bar a flower of a poor girl. Oh, it's because I called him Captain. Oh, sir, I meant no harm. Please don't let him lay a charge against me for a word like that. Charge? I make no charge. Really, sir, if you're a detective, you need not begin protecting me against molestation by young women unless I ask. Anyone can see the gal meant no harm. Oh, no, 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 how do you know my people come from Selsey? Never you mind. They did. And how do you come to be up so far east? You were born in Lisson Grove. Oh! What harm was there in me leaving Lisson Grove? It wasn't fit for a pig to live in. And I had to pay four and six. Live where you like, but stop that noise. Oh. Come, come. He can't touch you. You've a right to live where you please. Ah, oh, Park Lane, for instance. Oh, I'd like to go into the house and question with you, I want. What <laughs> girl I am? Where do I come from? Hoxton. Well, who said I didn't? Well, I mean, you know everything, you don't. 
ain't no quarter medal with me, eh? Of course he ain't. Don't you stand it from him. Now, now look here. What cause have you got to meddle with people? What never offered to meddle with you? Yeah. Say what he likes. I don't want to have no truck with him. Take us for dirt under your feet, don't you? Mm. Catch yeah. you taking liberties with a gentleman. Yeah. Right. Tell him. Tell him where he comes from if you yeah. want to go into fortune telling. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Cheltenham, Harrow, Cambridge, and India. Quite right. Oh. Oh. Music hall. I thought of that. Perhaps I shall someday. He's no gentleman. He's not to interfere with a poor girl. Uh, uh, is Freddie doing? I shall get pneumonia if I stay in this draft any longer. Earl's Court. Will you please keep her impertinent remarks to yourself? Oh, did I say that out loud? I didn't mean to. I beg your pardon. Your mother's epsom unmistakably. How very curious. I was brought up in Large Lady Park near Epsom. <laughs> What the devil of a man. Oh, excuse me. You want a cab, do you? Don't dare speak to me. Oh, please, please, Clara. We should be so grateful to you, sir, if you found us a cab. <coughs> I've told you he's a plain clothes copper. Oh, that ain't a police whistle. It's a sporting whistle. He's no right to take away me character. Me character's the same to me as any lady's. <laughs> I don't know whether you've noticed it, but the rain stopped about two minutes ago. So he has. Why didn't you tell us before? Us wasting our time listening to your silliness. I know where you come from. Anwell Asylum. Go back there. Hanwell. Oh, thank you, teacher. Frightening people Shall like that. How would he like it himself? It's quite fine now, Clara. We can walk to a motor bus. Come, but the cab. Oh, how tiresome. Poor girl. Hard enough to live without being worried and chivvy. How do you do it, may I ask? Simply phonetics, a science of speech. That's my profession, also my hobby. Happy is a man who can make a living from his hobby. You can spot an Irishman or a Yorkshireman by his brogue. I can place any man within six miles. I can place him within two miles in London, sometimes within two streets. What would be ashamed of himself, unmanly coward? Is there a living in that? Oh, yes, quite a fat one. This is an age of upstarts. Men begin in Kentish Town with £80 a year and end in Park Lane with 100000 They want to drop Kentish Town, but they give themselves away every time they open their mouths. Now, I can teach they them that... mind his own business. One, cease this detestable boo-hooey instantly or else seek the shelter of some other place of worship. I have a right to be here if I like, same as you. A woman who utters such depressing and disgusting sounds has no right to be anywhere, no right to live. Remember that you are a human being with a soul and the divine gift of articulate speech. But your native language is the language of Shakespeare and Milton and the Bible. And don't sit there crooning like a bilious pigeon. Oh. Heaven, what a sound. Oh. <laughs> you see this creature with her curbstone English? The English that will keep her in the gutter to the end of her days. Well, sir, in six months, I could pass her off as a duchess at an ambassador's garden party. I could even get her a place as lady's maid or shop assistant, which requires better English. What's that you say? Yes, you squashed cabbage leaf. You disgrace to the noble architecture of these columns, you incarnate insult to the English language. I could pass you off as the Queen of Sheba. Can you believe that? Yes, of course I can. I am myself a student of Indian dialects. Oh, really? Do you know Colonel Pickering, the author of Spoken Sanskrit? I am Colonel Pickering. Who are you? Henry Higgins, the author of Higgins' Universal Alphabet. I came from India to meet you. I was going to India to meet you. Where do you live? 27A, Wimpole Street. Come and see me tomorrow. I am at the Carlton. Come with me now and let's have a jaw over some supper. Right you are. <laughs> uh, do buy up now, kind sir. I'm short for me lodging. I'm sorry, I haven't any change, really. Liar! You said you could change half a crown. Ah, uh, you are be stuffed with nails, you want. Here, take the old blooming basket for sixpence. A reminder. Two ladies that we're here. 
They walked the bus when rain stopped. And left me with a cab on my hands. Damnation! Never mind, young man. I'm going to have in a taxi. Hold on, girl. Eight pence ain't no object to me, Charlie. Angel call Drury Lane next to Mickle John's oil shop and let's see how far she can make her up it. All right, in you go. That's a whole show. It's really amazing. I, I haven't taken half of it in, you know. Would you like to go over any of it again? No, thanks, not now. I'm quite done up for this morning. Tired of listening to sound? Yes, it's a fearful strain. You know, I rather fancy myself because I can pronounce 24 distinct vowel sounds, but you're 130, beat me. I couldn't hear a bit of difference between most of them. Well, that counts with practice. You'll hear no difference at first, but you keep on listening, and presently you'll find that they're as different as A from B. What is it? A young woman asks to see you, sir. A young woman? What does she want? Well, sir, she says you'll be very glad to see her when you know what she's come about. But she's quite a common girl, sir. Very common indeed. Oh, I would have sent her away. Only I thought perhaps you wanted her to talk into your machines. I hope I've not done wrong. But really, you do see such queer people sometimes. You'll excuse me, sir, I'm sure. Well, that's all right, Mrs. Pierce. Is she an interesting accent? Oh, something dreadful, sir, really. I don't know how you can take an interest in it. Let's have her up. Shut up, Mrs. Pierce. Very well, sir. It's for you to say. This is rather a bit of luck. I'll show you how I make records. We'll set her talking and I'll take it down in Bell's visible speech then in broad Romic and then we'll get her on the phonograph so that you can turn her on as often as you like with the written transcript before you. This is the young woman, sir. Why, well, this is the girl I jotted down last night. She's no use. I've got all the records I want of the Listen Grove lingo and I'm not going to waste another cylinder on it. Be off with you. I don't want you. Don't you be so saucy. You ain't heard what I come for yet. Did you tell him I come in a taxi? Nonsense, girl. What do you think a gentleman like Mr. Higgins cares what you came in? Ah, oh, we are proud. He ain't above giving lessons, not him. I heard him say so. Well, I ain't come here to ask for any compliment. And if me money's not good enough, I can go elsewhere. Good enough for what? Good enough for you. Now you know, don't you? You come to have lessons, I am. Pie for him too, make no mistake. <sighs> What do you expect me to say to you? Well, if you was a gentleman, you might ask me to sit down, I think. Pickering, shall we ask this baggage to sit down, or shall we throw her out of the window? No! I won't be called a baggage when I've offered to play like a lady. Well, what is it you want? I want to be a lady in the flower shop, instead of selling at the corner of Tottenham Court Road. But they won't take me unless I can talk more genteel. He said he could teach me. Well, here I am. Ready to pay, not asking any favour, and he treats me as if I was dirt. How can you be such a foolish, ignorant girl as to think you could afford to pay, Mr Higgins? And why shouldn't I? I know what lessons cost, same as you, and I'm ready to pay. How much? Now you're talking. I thought you'd come off it when you saw a chance of getting back a bit where you chucked at me last night. You'd had a drop in, then you? Sit down. Ah, if you're going to make a compliment... Sit out. down! Sit down, girl. Do as you're told. Oh! Won't you sit down? Don't mind if I do. What's your name? Eliza Doolittle. Eliza, Elizabeth, Betsy and Bess, they went to the woods to get a bird's nest. They found a nest with four eggs in it. They took one apiece and left three in it. <laughs> oh, don't be silly. You mustn't speak to the gentleman like that. Well, why won't he speak sensible to me? Come back to business. How much do you propose to pay me for the lessons? Ah, uh, I know what's right. A lady friend of mine gets French lessons for 18 pence an hour from a real French gentleman. Now, 
You wouldn't have the face to ask the same for teaching me my own language as you would for French. So I won't give Morn a shilling. Take it or leave it. Pickering, if you consider a shilling, not as a simple shilling, but as a percentage of this girl's income, it works out as fully equivalent to 60 or 70 guineas from a millionaire. How so? Work it out. A millionaire has about £150 a day. She earns about half a crown. Who told you she I She offers me two-fifths of her day's income for a lesson. Two-fifths of a millionaire's income would be somewhere about £60. Pounds. It's handsome. By George, it's enormous! It's the biggest offer I ever had! Sixty pounds? What are you talking about? I never offered you sixty pounds! Where would I get sixty pounds? Hold your tongue! But I haven't got sixty pounds! Don't <laughs> cry, you silly girl! Sit down, nobody's going to touch your money! Somebody's going to touch you with a broomstick if you don't stop snivelling. Sit down! Oh, one would think you was me father! If I decide to teach you, I'll be worse than two fathers to you here. What's that for? To wipe your eyes to wipe any part of your face that feels moist. Remember, that is your handkerchief and that is your sleeve. Don't mistake the one for the other if you wish to be a lady in a shop. It's no use talking to her like that, Mr Higgins. She doesn't understand you. Besides, you've got it quite wrong. She doesn't do it that way at all. Yeah, you give me that handkerchief. He gave it a mean off to you. He did. I think it must be regarded as her property, Mrs Pierce. <sighs> Serves you right, Mr Higgins. Higgins, I'm interested. What about the ambassador's garden party? I'll say you're the greatest teacher alive if you can make that good. And I'll bet you all the expenses of the experiment that you can't do it, and I'll pay for the lessons. Oh, you are real good. Thank you, Captain. It's almost irresistible. She's so deliciously low, so horribly dirty. Dirty. I washed my face and my hands before I come, I did. Well, you're certainly not going to turn her head with flattery, Higgins. Oh, don't say that, sir. There's more ways than one of turning a girl's head, and nobody can do it better than Mr Higgins, though he may not always mean it. I do hope, sir, you won't encourage him to do anything foolish. What is life but a series of inspired follies? The difficulty is to find them to do. Never lose a chance. It doesn't come every day. I shall make a duchess of this draggle-tailed gutter snipe. Oh. Yes, in six months. In three, if she has a good ear and a quick tongue, I'll take her anywhere and pass her off as anything. We start today. Now, this moment. Take her away and clean her, Mrs Pierce. Monkey brand if it won't come off any other way. Is there a good fire in the kitchen? Yes, Take but... all her clothes off and burn them. Ring up Whiteley's or somebody for new ones. Wrap her up in brown paper till they come. You're oh, no, gentlemen, you're not to talk of such things. I'm a good girl, I am, and I know the like of you, or I do. We want none of your listen grove prudery here, young woman. You've got to learn to behave like a duchess. Take her away, Mrs Pierce. If she gives you any trouble, wallop her. No, I'll call the police, I will. But I've no place to put her. Put her in the dustbin. Oh. Come, Higgins, be reasonable. You must be reasonable, Mr Higgins. Really, you must. You can't walk over everybody like this. Hi. Walk over everybody? My dear Mrs Pierce, my dear Pickering, I never had the slightest intention of walking over anybody. All I propose is that we should be kind to this poor girl. We must help her to prepare and to fit herself for her new station in life. If I did not express myself clearly, it was because I did not wish to hurt her delicacy or yours. Well, did you ever hear anything like that, sir? Never, Mrs. Pierce, never. What's the matter? Well, the matter is that you can't take a girl up like that as if you're picking up a pebble off the beach. Why not? Why not? But you don't know anything about her. What about her parents? She might be married. Ah, As the girl very properly says, Gian, married indeed. Don't you know a woman of that class looks a worn-out drudge of 50 a year after she's married? Who'd marry me? By George Eliza, the streets will be strewn with the bodies of men shooting themselves for your sake before I've done with you. Nonsense, sir. You mustn't talk to her like that. I'm going away. He's off his chump, he is. I don't want no barmies teaching me. Oh, indeed. Mad, am I? Very well, Mrs. Pierce. You needn't order the new clothes. Throw her out. No, you've no right to touch me. Now you know what comes of being saucy. This way, please. I didn't want no clothes. I wouldn't have took him. 
I can buy me own clothes. You're an ungrateful, wicked girl. This is my return for offering to take you from the gutter and dress you beautifully and make a lady of you. Stop, Mr. Higgins. I won't allow it. It's you that's being wicked. Go home to your parents, girl, and tell them to take better care of you. I ain't got no parents. They tell me I was big enough to earn my own living and turn me out. But where's your mother? I ain't got no mother. Her that turned me out was me sick stepmother. But I done without him. And I'm a good girl, I am. Very well, then. What on earth is all this fuss about? The girl doesn't belong to anybody. Is no use to anybody but me. You can adopt her, Mrs. Pierce. I'm sure a daughter will be a great amusement to you. Now, don't make any more fuss. Take her downstairs. But and... what's to become of her? Is she to be paid anything? Do be sensible, I'll sir. I'll pay her whatever is necessary. Put it down in the housekeeper's book. What on earth will she want with money? She'll only drink if you give her money. It's a lie. Nobody ever saw the sign of liquor on me. Oh, sir, you're a gentleman. Don't let him speak to me like that. Does it occur to you, Higgins, that the girl has some feelings? Oh. No, I don't think so. Not any feelings that we need bother about. Have you, Eliza? I got me feelings, same as anyone else. You see the difficulty? Mm -hmm. What difficulty? Getting her to talk grammar. Mere pronunciation is easy enough. But I don't want to talk grammar. I want to talk like a lady in a shop. Will you please keep to the point, Mr. Higgins? What's to become of the girl when you've finished your teaching? What's to become of her if I leave her in the gutter? Answer me that, Mrs. Pierce. Well, that's her own business, not yours, Mr. Higgins. Well, when I finish with her, we can throw her back into the gutter. Then it will be our own business again, so that's all right. Oh, you've no feeling art in you. You don't care for nothing but yourself. Here, I've had enough of this. I'm going. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, you ought. Have some chocolate, Eliza. How do I know what might be in him? I've heard of girls being drugged by the like of you. Pledge of good faith, Eliza. I eat one half. You eat the other. No. You're... You shall have boxes of them, barrels of them, every day. You shall live on them. Well, the one that's at it, and I'm too ready like to take it out of my mouth. Listen, Eliza, I think you said you came in a taxi. And well, what if I did have as good a ride to take a taxi as anyone else? You have indeed, Eliza. And in future, you shall have as many taxis as you want. You shall go up and down and round the town in a taxi. Think of that, Eliza. Mr Higgins, you're tempting the girl. She should think of the future. Nonsense at her age. Time enough to think of the future when you've no future to think of. No, Eliza, think of chocolates and taxis and gold and diamonds. No, I don't want no gold and no diamonds. I'm a good girl, I am. You shall remain so, Eliza, under the care of Mrs. Pierce, and you shall marry an officer in the guards with a beautiful moustache, the son of a marquis, who will disinherit him for marrying you, but relent when he sees your beauty and goodness. Excuse me, Higgins, but I really must interfere. Mrs. Pierce is quite right. If this girl is to put herself in your hands for six months for an experiment in teaching, she must understand thoroughly what she's doing. How can she? She's incapable of understanding anything. Besides, do any of us understand what we're doing? If we did, would we ever do it? Very clever, but not to the present point. Miss Doolittle. Oh. There, that's all you get from Eliza. Oh. No use explaining as a military man. You ought to know that. Give her her orders. That's enough for her. Eliza, you ought to live here for the next six months learning how to speak beautifully like a lady in a florist shop. If you're good and do whatever you're told, you shall sleep in a proper bedroom and have lots to eat and money to buy chocolates and take rides in taxis. If you're naughty and idle, you will sleep in the back kitchen among the black beetles and be walloped by Mrs. Pierce with a broomstick. At the end of six months, you shall go to Buckingham Palace in a carriage, beautifully dressed. If the king finds out that you are not a lady, you will be taken by the police to the Tower of London, where your head will be cut off as a warning to other presumptuous flower girls. If you are not found out, you shall have a present of seven and sixpence to start life with as a lady in a shop. If you refuse this offer, you'll be a most ungrateful, wicked girl. And the angels will weep for you. Now you're satisfied, Pickering? Can I put it more plainly and fairly, Mrs. Pierce? Well, I think perhaps you'd better let me speak to the girl properly, in private. Of course, I know you don't mean her any harm. But when you get what you call interested in people's accents, you never think or care what may happen to them or you. Come with me, Eliza. That's all right, Mrs. Pierce. Thank you. Bundle off to the bathroom. You're a great bully, you are. 
I won't stay here if I don't like. And I won't let nobody wallop me. I never asked to go to Buckingham Palace, I didn't. And I've never been in trouble with the police. Not me, I'm a good girl. Don't answer back, girl. You don't understand the gentleman. Well, what I say is right, I won't go near the king, not if I'm going to have my head cut off. No, if I'd known what I was letting myself in for, I never would have come here. I always been a good girl. I never ought to say a word to you. Come on, come on. I haven't, and I've got me feelings. Excuse the straight question, Higgins, but are you a man of good character where women are concerned? Have you ever met a man of good character where women are concerned? Yes, very frequently. Well, I haven't. I find that the moment I let a woman make friends with me, she becomes jealous, exacting, suspicious, and a damned nuisance. I find that the moment I let myself make friends with a woman, I become selfish and tyrannical. Women upset everything. When you let them into your life, you find that the woman is driving at one thing while you're driving at another. So here I am, a confirmed old bachelor and likely to remain so. Come, Higgins, you know what I mean. If I'm to be in this business, I shall feel responsible for the girl. Now, I hope it is understood that no advantage be taken of her position. What? That thing? Sacred, I assure you. You see, she'll be a pupil, and teaching would be impossible unless pupils were sacred. I've taught scores of American millionaires how to speak English, the best-looking women in the world. I'm seasoned. They might as well be blocks of wood. I might as well be a block of wood. It's... <clears throat> well, is it all right, Mrs. Pierce? I just wish to trouble you with a word, if I may, Mr. Higgins. Certainly. Come in. Don't burn that, Mrs. Pierce. I'll keep it as a curiosity. What do you wish to say to me? Oh, am I in the way? Not at all, sir. Mr. Higgins, will you please be very particular what you say before the gun? Of course, I'm always particular about what I say. Why do you say this to me? No, sir, you're not at all particular when you've mislaid anything or when you're getting a little impatient. Now, it doesn't matter before me. I'm used to it. But you really must not swear before the girl. Swear? I never swear. I detest the habit. What the devil do you mean? That's what I mean, sir. You swear a great deal too much. Now, I don't mind your damning and blasting, but there is a certain word I must ask you not to use. The girl used it herself when she began to enjoy the bath. It begins with the same letter as bath. Now, she knows no better. She learned it at her mother's knee, but she must not hear it from your lips. Well, I cannot charge myself with having ever uttered it, Mrs. Pierce. Except perhaps in moments of extreme and justifiable excitement. Only this morning, sir, you applied it to your boots, to the butter and to the brown bread. Oh, that. Mere alliteration, Mrs. Pierce. Natural to a poet. <laughs> well... Whatever you choose to call it, I beg you not to let the girl hear you repeat it. Oh, very well, very well. Is that all? No, sir. We shall have to be very particular with this girl as to her personal cleanliness. Certainly. Quite right. Most important. I mean not to be slovenly in her dress or untidy in leaving things about. Just so. I was about to draw your attention to that. It is these little things that matter, Pickering. Take care of the pence and the pounds will take care of themselves. It's as true of personal habits as it is of money. Yes, sir. Then might I ask you not to come down to breakfast in your dressing gown, or at any rate not to use it as a napkin to the extent that you do, sir. And if you would be so good as not to eat everything off the same plate, it would set a better example to the girl. You know, you nearly choked yourself on a fishbone in the jam only last week. I may do these things sometimes in absence of mind, but surely I don't do them habitually. By the way, my dressing gown smells most damnably of benzene. No doubt it does, sir. But if you will wipe your fingers... Oh, very well, very well. I'll wipe them in my hair in future. I hope you're not offended, Mr Higgins. Not at all. Not at all. You're quite right. I shall be particularly careful before the girl. Is that all? No, sir. Might she use some of those Japanese dresses you brought back from abroad? I really can't put her back into her old things. Certainly. Anything you like. Is that all? Thank you, sir. That's all. You know, Pickering, that woman has the most extraordinary ideas about me. Here I am, a shy, diffident sort of man. I've never been able to feel really grown up and tremendous like other chaps. 
And that she's firmly persuaded that I'm an arbitrary, overbearing, bossing kind of person. I can't count with her. If you please, sir, the trouble's beginning already. There's a dustman downstairs. Alfred Doolittle asks to see you. He says you have his daughter here. Phew! I say! Send a blackguard up! Very well, sir. But he may not be a blackguard, Higgins. Oh, not. Of course he's a blackguard. Well, whether he is or not, I think we're going to have some trouble from him. I think not. If there's any trouble to be had, he shall have it with me, not I with him. And we're sure to get something interesting from him. About the girl? No, I mean his darling. Oh. Do little, sir. <laughs> Professor Higgins! Here. Good morning. Sit down. Good morning, Governor. I come about a very serious matter, Governor. Born in Hounslow, Mother Welsh, I should think. What do you want, Doolittle? I want my daughter. That's what I want to see. Of course you do. You're her father, aren't you? Oh, you don't suppose anybody else wants her, do you? I'm glad to see you have some spark of family feeling left. She's upstairs. Take her away at once. What? Take her away. You don't suppose I'm going to keep your daughter for you, do you? Now, look here, Governor. Is this reasonable? Is it fair to see to take advantage of a man like this? The girl belongs to me. You've got her. Where do I come in? How dare you come here and try to blackmail me? You sent her here on purpose. No, Governor. Of course you did. How else could you possibly know that she is here? Don't take a man up like that, Governor. The police shall take you up. This is a plot. A plot to extort money from me by threats. I shall telephone for the police. Have I asked for a brass farthing? I'll leave it to the gentleman here. Have I said a word about money? What else did you come for? Well, I'll tell you if you let me get a word in. I'm willing to tell you. I'm wanting to tell you. I'm waiting to tell you. Pickering, this chap has a certain natural gift of rhetoric. Observe the rhythm of his native wood notes wild. I'm willing to tell you, I'm wanting to tell you, I'm waiting to tell you. Sentimental rhetoric, that's the Welsh strain in him. It also accounts for his mendacity and dishonesty. Oh, please, Higgins, I'm West Country myself. Now, how did you know the girl was here if you didn't send her? Well, it was like this, Governor. The girl took a boy in a taxi to give him a jaunt. Son of the landlady he is. Well, she sent him back for her luggage when she heard you was willing for her to stop here. I met the lad on the corner of Longacre and Endell Street. How much luggage? Musical instrument, a few pictures, tribal jewellery, and a bird cage. She said she didn't want no clothes. Well, what was I to think from that? I ask you, Governor, as a parent, what was I to think? So you came to save her from worse than death, is that it? Just so, that's right. No. Well, why did you bring her luggage if you intended to take her away? Have I said a word about taking her away? Have I now? You're going to take her away, double quick. No, don't say that, Governor. I'm not the man to stand in my girl's life. He has a career opening up for us, you might say. Mrs. Pierce, this is Eliza's father. He has come to take her away. Give her to him. That's a misunderstanding. Listen to me. But he can't take her away, Mr. Higgins. How can he? You told me to burn her clothes. That's right. I can't carry her through the streets like a blooming monkey, can I? I put it to you. You have put it to me that you want your daughter. Take your daughter. She has no clothes. Go out and buy herself. Where's the clothes she coming? Did I burn them? What did you miss it here? I am the housekeeper if you please. I've sent for some clothes for your girl. When they come, you can take her away. You can wait in the kitchen. This way, please. Listen, Governor. You and me is men of the world, ain't we? Oh, men of the world, are we? You'd better go, Mrs. Pearce. I think so indeed, sir. The floor is yours, Mr. Doolittle. Oh, thank you, Governor. Well, the truth is, Governor, I've sort of taken a fancy to you. And if you want the girl, I'm not that set on having her back home again. But what I might not be open to, an arrangement. Regarded in the light of a young woman, she's a fine, handsome girl. But as my daughter, she ain't worth her keep. So I tell you straight, all I want is me rights as a father. And you're the last man alive to expect me to give her up for nothing. I can see you're one of the straight sort. I mean, what's a five-pound note to you? 
And what's Eliza to me? I think you ought to know, Doolittle, that Mr Higgins' intentions are entirely honourable. Of course they are, Governor. If I thought they weren't, I'd ask 50. You mean to say you'd sell your daughter for 50 pounds? Not in a general way, I wouldn't. But to oblige a gentleman like you, I'd do a good deal, I do assure you. Have you no morals, man? Can't afford them, Governor. Neither could you if you was as poor as me. Not that I mean any harm, mind you, but if Eliza's going to make a bit out of this, why not me too? I don't know what to do, Pickering. There can be no doubt that as a question of morals, it's a positive crime to give this chap a farthing it. I feel a certain rough justice in his claim. That's right, Governor. That's what I say. A father's art, as it were. Yes, yes, I know how you feel, but it hardly seems right. Don't say that, Governor. Don't look at it that way. What am I, Governors both, I ask you? What am I? I'm one of the undeserving poor. That's what I am. Think what that means to a man. It means he's up against middle-class morality all the time. Well, I don't need less than a deserving man. I need more. I don't need less arty than him. And I drink a lot more. Therefore, I put it to you as two gentlemen not to play that game on me. I'm playing straight with you. I ain't pretending to be deserving. I'm undeserving. And I mean to go on being undeserving. I like it. And that's the truth. Would you take advantage of a man's nature to do him out of the price of his own daughter what he's brought up and fed and clothed by the sweat of his brow till she's grown big enough to be interesting to you two gentlemen? I mean, is five pounds unreasonable? I'll put it to you and I'll leave it to you. Pickering, if we were to take this chap in hand for three months, he could choose between a seat in the cabinet and a popular pulpit in Wales. What do you say to that, Doolittle? Not me, Governor. Thank you kindly. I've heard all the preachers and prime ministers from a thinking man and game for politics or religion or social reform, same as all the other amusements. And I'll tell you, it's a dog's life any way you look at it. No, undeserving poverty is my line. I suppose we must give him a fiver. He'd only make bad use of it, I'm afraid. Not me, Governor, so help me, I won't. Oh, don't you be afraid that I'll save it and spare it and live idle on it. There won't be a penny of it left by Monday. I'll have to go back to work, same as if I'd never had it. Just one last spree for myself and the missus, giving pleasure to ourselves, employment to others, and satisfaction to you to know that your money ain't been thrown away. You couldn't spend it better. This is irresistible. Let's give him ten. Uh, uh, oh, no, 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 Governor, no, no. Uh, no, she wouldn't have the art to spend ten. Probably I shouldn't neither. Ten pounds is a lot of money. It makes a man feel prudent-like, and then goodbye to happiness. No, just give me what I asked for, not a penny more. Or not a penny less. Well, why don't you marry that missus of yours? Tell her so, Governor, tell her so. I'm willing. I'm the one who suffers by it. I've got no hold on her. I'm a slave to that woman, Governor, just because I'm not her lawful husband. And she knows it too. Catch her marrying me. You take my advice, Governor. You marry Eliza while she's young and don't know no better. If you don't, you'll be sorry for it after. If you do, she'll be sorry for it after. But better her than you, because you're a man. She's only a woman. Doesn't know how to be happy anyhow. Figuring if he listened to this chap another minute, we should have no convictions left. Five pounds, I think you said. That's right, Governor. I'm sure you won't take ten. Uh, not now, Governor. Some other time. There you go. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, gentlemen. <laughs> Oh, big pardon, miss. Gone! Don't you know your own daughter? Blimey! It's Liza! This? By Jove! Don't I look silly? <laughs> silly? Now, Mr Higgins, don't say anything to make the girl conceited about herself. Oh, quite right, Mrs Pierce, yes. Damn silly. Please, sir. I'm extremely silly. I should look all right with me at on. Here, what? A new fashion by George. It ought to look horrible. I never thought she'd clean up as good looking as that. She's a real credit to me, ain't she? I tell you, it's easy to clean up here. Hot and cold water on tap there is, just as much as you like. And woolly towels there is, and a towel or so hot it burns your fingers. And soft brushes to scrub yourself with, and a wooden bowl of soap that smells like primroses. Now I know why ladies are so clean. 
wishing to treat for them. Wish they could see what it is for the likes of me. <laughs> she ain't accustomed to it, that's all. But she'll soon pick up your free and easy ways. I'm a good girl, I am. And I won't pick up no free and easy ways. Eliza, if you say again that you are a good girl, your father shall take you home. Oh, damn, you don't know me father. All he came here for was to touch her for some money to get drunk on. What else would you want money for? Putting the plate in church, I suppose. Don't you give me any of your lip, my girl. And don't you let me hear you giving this gentleman any of your lip, or you'll hear about it from me later, see? Have you any further advice to give your daughter before you go, Mr. Doolittle? Your blessing, for instance. Not me, Governor. I ain't such a mug as to put up my children all I know myself. Hard enough to hold them in without that. You want Liza's mind improved, you do it yourself with a strap. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Mum. You won't see him again in a hurry. I don't want to, Eliza, do you? No, not me. I don't want never to see him again, I doubt. He's a disgrace to me, he is, collecting dust at a workman's trade. What is his trade, Eliza? Talking money out of other people's pockets into his own. Ain't you going to call me Miss Doolittle anymore? Oh, I beg your pardon, Miss Doolittle. It was a slip of the tongue. I don't mind, only it sounded so genteel. I should just like to take a taxi down the corner of Tottenham Court Road and get out and tell it to wait there for me just to put the girls in their place a bit. I wouldn't speak to them, you know. You better wait till we've got you something really fashionable. Oh, well, if I'm their fashionable clothes, I'll wait. I should like to have some. Mrs. Pierce told me you're going to give me some to wear in bed at night, different to what I wear in the daytime. Mm hmm Well, it do seem a terrible waste of money when you could get something to show. Besides, I never could fancy changing them into cold things on a winter's night. Now, Eliza, the things have come for you to try on. Oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Don't rush about like that, girl. Pickery, we have taken on a stiff job, Higgins. We have. Cheese. Oh. 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 Sat on post. Two ghosts sat on post, drinking toast to their hosts. Hosts. Sat on post, drinking toast to their hosts. Hosts. The shallow depression. The shallow depression. In the west of these islands. In the west of these islands. Is ba. A E R O U. A E R O U. That's the way the tip. Red leather, yellow leather. Red leather, yellow leather. Red leather, yellow leather. Red leather, yellow leather. Sit up. Shallow depression in the west of these islands. Is likely to move slowly. In an easterly direction. A cup of tea. The shallow depression in the west of these islands is likely to move slowly in an easterly direction. Who goes and sat on post, drinking toast to their hosts? Good girl. It is my home day. You 
You promised not to come. How bother. Go home at once. I know. I came here on purpose. Yes, but you mustn't. I'm serious, dear. You offend all my friends. They stop coming whenever they meet you. Nonsense. I know I have no small talk, but people don't mind. Oh, don't they? Small talk indeed. What about your large talk? Really, dear, you mustn't stay. I must. I have a job for you. A phonetic job. No use, dear. I can't get round your vowels. Well, it isn't a phonetic job. You said it was. Well, not your part of it. You see, <clears throat> I've picked up a girl. Does that mean that some girl has picked you up? Not at all. I don't mean a love affair. What a pity. Why? Well, you'll never fall in love with anyone under 45. When will you discover that there are some rather attractive young women about? Oh, I can't be bothered with young women. My idea of a lovable woman is somebody as like you as possible. I shall never get into the way of rarely liking young women. Some habits lie too deep to be changed. Besides, they're all idiots. Do you know what you would do if you really loved me, Henry? Oh, bother. What? Marry, I suppose. No, stop fidgeting. And take your hands out of your pockets. That's a good boy. <laughs> now, tell me about the girl. She's coming to see you. I don't remember asking her. You didn't. I asked her. If you'd known her, you wouldn't have asked her. Indeed. Why? Well, it's like this. You see, she's a common flower girl. I picked her off the curbstone. And invited her to my at-home? Oh, that'll be all right. I've taught her to speak properly, and she has strict orders as to her behaviour. She's to keep to two subjects, the weather and everybody's health. Oh. Fine day, and how do you do, you know? And that will be safe. Safe? To talk about our health, about our insides? Perhaps about our outsides? How could you be so silly, Henry? But she must talk about something. Oh, she'll be all right, Mother. Don't you fuss. Pickering is in it with me. You see, I have a sort of bet on that I'll pass her off as a duchess in six months. I shall win my bet. She is a quick ear. And she's easier to teach than my middle-class pupils because she's had to learn a complete new language. She speaks English almost as you speak French. Well, that is satisfactory at all events. It is, and it isn't. What does that mean? You see, I've got her pronunciation all right, but you have to consider not only how a girl pronounces, but what she pronounces, and that's where the whole Mrs. thing... Mrs. and Miss Einsford Hill, how do you do? How do you do? My son, Henry. Your celebrated son? I have so longed to meet you, Professor Higgins. Delighted. How do you do? I've seen you somewhere before. I haven't the ghost of a notion where, but I remember your voice. It doesn't matter. Better sit down. I am sorry to say that my celebrated son has no manners. You mustn't mind him. I don't. Mm. Not at all. Have I been rude? I didn't mean to be. Colonel Pickering. Oh. How do you do, Mrs. Higgins? So glad you've come. Do you know Mrs. Ainsford Hill? Miss Ainsford Hill? Has, um... Has Henry told you what we've come for? No, we were interrupted, damn it. Henry, really. Uh, are we in the way? No. No, you couldn't have come more fortunately. We want you to meet a friend of ours. Yes, my George, we could do with two or three people. You'll do as well as anybody else. Mr. Ainsford Hill. Good Lord of heaven, another of them. How to do? So good of you to come. Uh, C Colonel Pickering. How to do? I uh, don't think you've met my son, Professor Higgins. How to do? I'll take my oath I've seen you somewhere before. Where was it? I don't think so. It don't matter anyhow. You better sit down. Well, here we all are. <laughs> What the devil are we going to talk about until Eliza comes? Henry, you are the life and soul of the Royal Society's soirees, but you are really rather trying on more commonplace occasions. Am I? Mm. Sorry. Suppose I am, you know. <laughs> I sympathise. I haven't any small talk. If people would only be frank and say what they really think. Lord forbid. But why? What they think they ought to think is bad enough, Lord knows, but what they'd really think would upset the whole show. Do you think it would be really agreeable if I were to say what I really think? Is it so very cynical? Cynical? Who the dickens said it was cynical? I mean, it wouldn't be decent. Oh, I'm sure you don't mean that, Mr. Higgins. You see, we're all savages, more or less. We're supposed to be civilised and cultured and all about 
poetry and philosophy and art and science, but how many of us know even the meaning of these words? What do you know of poetry? What do you know of science? What does he know of art or science or anything else? What the devil do you imagine I know of philosophy? Or of manners, Henry. Miss Doolittle. Yes, she is, Mother. How do you do, Mrs. Higgins? Mr. Higgins told me I might come. Yes, quite right. I'm very glad indeed to see you. How do you do, Miss Doolittle? Colonel Pickering, is it not? I feel sure that we have met before, Miss Doolittle. I remember your eyes. How do you do? My daughter, Clara. How do you do? How do you do? I've certainly had the pleasure. My son, Freddy. How do you do? By the... George, yes, it all come back to me. Covent Garden. <laughs> oh, what a... Damnable thing. Oh, Henry, Henry, really? No, no, don't sit on my desk. You break it. Oh, sorry. depression in the west of these islands is likely to move slowly in an easterly direction. There are no indications of any great change in the barometrical situation. <laughs> How awfully funny. What is wrong with that, young man? I bet I got it right. <laughs> Killing. I'm sure I hope it won't turn cold. There is so much influenza about. It runs right through our whole family regularly every spring. My aunt died of influenza. So they said. But it's my belief they done the old woman in. Done her in? Yes, Lord love you. Why should she die of influenza? She come through... Diphtheria, right enough, the year before. I saw her with my own eyes. Fairly blue with it, she was. They all thought she was dead. But my father, he kept ladling gin down her throat till she came to so sudden she bit the bowl off the spoon. <laughs> Dear me. What call would a woman with that strength in her have to die of influenza? And what become of her new straw hat that should have come to me? Somebody pinched it. And what I say is, them as pinched it done her in. What does doing her in mean? Oh, that's new small talk. To do someone in means to kill them. Surely don't believe your aunt was killed. Do I not? Them she lived with would have killed her for a hat pin, let alone a hat. Ooh. But it can't have been right for your father to pour spirits down her throat like that. It might have killed her. Not her. Gin was mother's milk to her. Besides, he'd poured so much down his own throat, he knew the good of it. Do you mean that he drank? Drank? My word, something chronic. How dreadful for you. Not a bit. It never did him no harm what I could see. But then he did not keep it up regular. On the burst, as you might say, from time to time. And always more agreeable when he'd had a drop in. There's lots of women has to make their husbands drunk to make them fit to live with. You see, it's like this. If a man has a bit of a conscience, it 
always takes him when he's sober and that it makes him low-spirited. A drop of booze just takes that off and makes him happy. <laughs> Here, what are you sniggering at? It's the new small talk. You do it so awfully well. If I was doing it proper, what was you laughing at? Have I said anything I oughtn't? Not at all, Miss Doolittle. Well, that's a mercy anyhow. What I always... <coughs> <coughs> oh, I oh. must go. So pleased to have met you, Mrs. Higgins. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Colonel Pickering. Goodbye, Miss Doolittle. Goodbye, all. Are you walking across the park, Miss Doolittle? If so... Walk? Not bloody likely. I'm going in a taxi. Well, I uh, really can't get used to the new ways. Oh, it's all right, Mama, quite right. People will think we never go anywhere or see anybody if you are so old-fashioned. I dare say I am very old-fashioned. But I do hope you won't begin using that expression, Clara. Don't you agree, Colonel Pickering? Oh, don't ask me. I've been away in India for several years and manners have changed so much that sometimes I don't know whether I'm at a respectable dinner table or in a ship's forecastle. <laughs> Nobody means anything by it. And it's so quaint. Give such a smart emphasis to things that are not in themselves. Very witty. Uh, well, I find after that, that, I think it's time for us to go. Oh, yes. We have three at homes to go to still. Goodbye, Goodbye Mrs. Higgins. Goodbye, Colonel Pickering. Goodbye, Professor Higgins. Goodbye. Don't forget to try on the new small talk at the three at homes. Don't be nervous. Pitch in strong. I will. Goodbye. Such nonsense, all this early Victorian prudery. Such damn nonsense. Such bloody nonsense. <laughs> 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 uh, well, I ask you. Uh, such bloody nonsense. Goodbye. Goodbye. Would you like to meet Miss Doolittle again? Yes, I should, most awfully. Well, you know my days. Yes. Thanks awfully. Goodbye. Goodbye. <clears throat> goodbye, Mr. Higgins. Goodbye, goodbye. Oh, it's no use. I shall never be able to bring myself to use that word. Don't. It's not compulsory, you know. You'll get on quite well without it. Goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> you mustn't mind, Clara. We're so poor and she gets to so few parties, poor child. She doesn't quite know. But the boy is nice, don't you think so? Oh, quite nice. I shall always be delighted to see him. Oh, thank you, dear. Goodbye. Okay. Her mummy is a lighter presentable. You silly boy. Of course she's not presentable. She is a triumph of your art and of her dressmakers. But if you suppose for one moment she doesn't give herself away with every sentence she utters... You must be perfectly cracked about her. But don't you think something might be done? I mean, something to eliminate the sanguinary element from our conversation. <laughs> Not as long as she is in Henry's hands. Do you mean my language is improper? No, dearest, it would be quite proper, say, on a canal barge. But it would not be proper for her at a garden party. Well, I must say. Come, Higgins, you must learn to know yourself. I haven't heard language like yours since we used to review the volunteers in Hyde Park. <laughs> well, if you say so, I just suppose I don't always talk like a bishop. Colonel Pickering... Will you tell me the exact state of things at Wimpole Street? Oh, well, I've come to live there with Henry. Uh, we worked together on my Indian dialects. Yes. We thought it was more convenient. Yes, quite. I, I know all about that. It's an excellent arrangement. But where does this girl live? With us, of course. Where should she live? But on what terms? Is she a servant? If not, what is she? Oh, I think I know what you mean, Mrs. Yeah. Higgins. Well, dash, if I do. She's useful. She knows where my things are and remembers my appointments and so forth. Besides, I've had to work at that girl for months to get her to her present pitch. I'm worn out thinking about her and watching her lips and her teeth and her tongue, not to mention her soul, which is the quaintest of the lot. Well, 
You certainly are a pretty pair of babies, playing with your live doll. Playing the hardest job I ever tackled? Make no mistake about that, Mother. But you have no idea how frightfully interesting it is to take a human being and turn her into quite a different human being by creating a new speech for her. It's filling up the deepest gulf that separates class from class and soul from soul. I assure you, Mrs Higgins, we take Eliza very seriously. Why, every week, every day almost, there's some new change in it. Yes, by George, the hardest job I ever tackled. She regularly fills out our lives, doesn't she, Pick? Oh, we're always talking, Eliza. Teaching Eliza. Dressing Eliza. What? Oh, what I Inventing I news, Eliza. Like you know, you know, I assure you, she's almost a genius, genius, like the most genius. Genius. thing was. The I've tried it with every possible idea. sound that a she human being can make. Talk, piano piano Continental talk, dialects, talk, African talk, dialects, talk, 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 Colonel Pickering, don't you realise that when Eliza walked into Wimpole Street, something walked in with her? Her father did, but Henry soon got rid of him. <laughs> it would have been more to the point if her mother had, but as her mother didn't, something else did. But what? A problem. Oh, I see. You mean the problem of how to pass her off as a lady. I'll solve that problem. I've half solved it already. No, you two infinitely stupid male creatures. The problem of what is to be done with her afterwards. I don't see anything in that. She can go her way with all the advantages I've given her. The advantages of that poor woman who was here just now. The manners and habits that disqualify a fine lady from earning her own living without giving her a fine lady's income. Is that what you mean? Oh, that'll be all right, Mrs Higgins. We'll find her some light employment. Yeah, she's happy enough. Don't you worry about her. Goodbye. No use bothering now. The thing's done. Bye-bye, Mummy. There are plenty of openings. We'll do what's best. Goodbye. Take to the Shakespeare expedition at Earl's Court. Yes, let her. Remarks will be delicious. Didn't let me call the people for a minute. Oh, men. Men. Chuck them over the banisters into the hall. She'll find them there in the morning. She'll think we were drunk. We are, slightly. Uh, are there any letters? I didn't look. No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> well, I wonder where the devil my slippers are. Isn't this son? Uh, this coroneted blade do for you. Money lender. Oh Lord, what an evening. What a crew. What a silly Tom. Foolery. Oh. Well, the hell are they? Mm, I feel a bit tired. It's been a long day. The garden party, a dinner party, then the reception. 
rather too much of a good thing. But you won your bet, Higgins. Eliza did the trick and something to spare, eh? <laughs> Thank God it is over. Were you nervous at the garden party? I was. Eliza didn't seem a bit nervous. Oh, she wasn't nervous. I knew she'd be all right now. It's a strain of putting the job through all these months and it's told on me. It was interesting enough at first while we were at the phonetic. But after that, I got deadly sick of it. If I hadn't backed myself to do it, I should have chucked the whole thing up months ago. It was a silly notion. The whole thing has been a bore. When I saw we were going to win, hands down, I felt like a bear in a cage. I tell you, a good pickety. Never again for me. No more artificial duchesses. The whole thing has been simple. Well, it was a great success. An enormous success. You know, I was quite frightened once or twice. And Liza was doing it so well. You see, a lot of the real people can't do it at all. It makes me mad. The silly people don't have their own silliness. However, it's over and done with. And now I can go to bed at last without dreading tomorrow. I think I'll turn into... Well, it's been a great occasion and a triumph for you. Good night. Good night. Oh, Eliza. Put out the lights, will you? And tell Mrs. Pierce I shan't... Take coffee in the morning, make me tea. with you. I've won your bet for you, haven't I? That's enough for you. I don't matter, I suppose. You, you won my bet. Presumptuous insect. I won it. What did you throw my slippers at me for? Because I wanted to smash your face. I'd like to kill you, you selfish brute. Why don't you throw me back where you found me in the gutter? You thank God it's all over and now you can throw me back again there, do you? The creature is nervous after all. No! Ah, would you? Claws in, you Cat, how dare you show your temper to me. Sit down and be quiet. <laughs> oh, what's to become of me? What's to become of me? How the devil do I know what's to become of you? What does it matter what becomes of you? You don't care. I know you don't care. You wouldn't care if I was dead. I'm nothing to you. Not so much as them slippers. Those slippers! Those slippers! I didn't think it made any difference now. Why have you begun going on like this? May I ask whether you complain of your treatment here? No. Has anyone treated you badly? Mrs. Pierce, Colonel Pickering, any of the servants? No. You don't presume to pretend that I have treated you badly? No. I'm very glad to hear it. Perhaps you're tired after the strain of the day. Like a glass of champagne? No. Thank you. This has been coming on you for some days. I suppose it was natural for you to be anxious about the garden party. But that's all over now. There's nothing more to worry about. No, there's nothing more for you to worry about. Oh, God. I wish I was dead. Why? In heaven's name, why? Listen to me, Eliza. All this irritation is purely subjective. I don't understand. I'm too ignorant. It's only imagination. Low spirits and nothing else. Nobody's hurting you. Nothing's wrong. You go to bed like a good girl and sleep it off. Have a little cry and say your prayers. That will make you comfortable. I heard your prayers. Thank God it's all over. Well, don't you thank God it's all over. Now you are free and can do what you like. What am I fit for? What have you left me fit for? 
Where am I to go? What am I to do? What is to become of me? Oh, that's what's worrying you, is it? I shouldn't bother about it if I were you, though I hadn't quite realised that you were going away. Might marry, you know. You see, Eliza, all men are not confirmed old bachelors like me and the Colonel. Most men are the marrying sort, poor devils, and you're not bad looking. It's quite a pleasure to look at you sometimes. Not now, of course, because now you're crying and looking as ugly as the very devil. But when you're all right and quite yourself, you're what I would call attractive. I dare say my mother could think of some chap or other who'd do very well. We're above that at the corner of Tottenham Court Road. What do you mean? I sold flowers. I didn't sell myself. Now that you have made a lady of me, I'm not fit to sell anything else. I wish you had left me where you found me. Tosh, Eliza, don't insult human relations by bringing all this cant about buying and selling into it. You needn't marry the chap if you don't like him. And what else am I to do? Lots of things. What about your old idea of a florist shop? Pickering could set you up in one. He has plenty of money. Um, you'll be all right. I must wobble off to bed. I'm devilish sleepy. Uh, by the way, I came down for something. I forget what it was. Your slippers. Oh, yes, of course. You shied them at me. Before you go, sir. Eh? Do my clothes belong to me or to Colonel Pickering? What the devil use would they be to pick her in? He might want them for the next girl you pick up to experiment on. Is that the way you feel towards us? I don't want to hear anything more about that. All I want to know is whether anything belongs to me. My own clothes were burnt. Why need you start bothering about it in the middle of the night? I want to know what I may take away with me. I don't want to be accused of stealing. Stealing? You shouldn't have said that, Eliza. That shows a want of feeling. I'm sorry. I'm only a common, ignorant girl. In my station, I have to be careful. There can't be any feeling between the like of you and the like of me. You may take the whole damned house full if you like. Except the jewels. They're hired. Will that satisfy you? Stop, please. Will you take these to your room and keep them safe? I don't want to run the risk of their being missing. Hand them over. If these belong to me instead of to the jeweller, I'd ram them down your ungrateful throat. This ring isn't the jeweller's. It's one you bought me in Brighton. I don't want it now. <gasps> don't hit me! Hit you? Infamous creature, it is you who've hit me! You have wounded me to the heart! I'm glad I've got a little of my own back anyhow! You have caused me to lose my temper, a thing that has hardly ever happened to me before. I prefer to say nothing more about it now. I'm going to bed. You'd better leave a note for Mrs. Pierce about the coffee, for she won't be told by me. Damn Mrs. Pierce, and damn the coffee, and damn you, and damn my own folly! In having lavished my hard-earned knowledge and the treasure of my intimacy and regard on a heartless gutter snipe! <laughs> damn Mrs. Pierce and damn the coffee and damn you!
Colonel Pickering. Well, show them up. They're using the telephone, Mum. Telephoning to the police, I think. What? Mr. Henry is in a state, Mum. I thought I'd better tell you. You had told me Mr. Henry was not in a state. It would be more surprising. Well, tell them to come up when they finished with the police. Yes, Mum. I suppose he's lost something. Oh. Sarah. Go upstairs and tell Miss Doolittle that Mr. Henry and the Colonel are here. Ask her not to come downstairs until I send for her. Yes, Mum. Here, Mother, is a confounded thing. Good morning. What is it? Eliza's bolted. Oh, you must have frightened her. Frightened her? Nonsense. She was left last night as usual to turn out the lights and all that. Instead of going to bed, she changed her clothes and went right off. Her bed wasn't slipped in. What am I to do? Do without, I'm afraid, dear. The girl has a perfect right to leave if she chooses. Well, I can't find anything. I don't know what my appointments are. Uh, morning, Mrs Higgins. Has Henry told you? What did that ass of an inspector have to say? Did you offer a reward? You don't mean to say you set the police after Eliza. Of course. What are the police for? What else could we do? The inspector made a lot of difficulties. You know, I really think he suspected us of some improper purpose. Well, of course he did. What right had you to go to the police and give them the girl's name as if she were a thief? Or a lost umbrella or something, really? But we want to find her. Yes, we can't just let her go like that, Mrs Higgins. What were we to do? You have no more sense, either of you, than two children. Why couldn't Mr. we? Mr Henry, a gentleman wants to see you very particular. He's been sent on from Wimpole Street. Oh, bother! I can't see anybody now. Who is it? Uh, Mr Doolittle, sir. Doolittle? Do you mean the dustman? Dustman? Oh, no, sir. Gentlemen. By George Pick, it's some relative of hers that she's gone to. Somebody we know nothing about. Send him out, quick. Yes, sir. Genteel relatives now still hear something. Do you know any of her people? Only her father, the fellow we told you about. Mr. Doolittle. Fear. You see this? You've done this. Done what, man? This, I tell you. Look at it. Look at his hat. Look at his coat. Has Eliza been buying you clothes? Eliza, not she. Why would she buy me clothes? Good morning, Mr. Doolittle. Won't you sit down? I'm asking your pardon, Mum. Thank you. Oh, I'm that full of everything that's happened to me. I can't think of anything else. What has happened to you? I shouldn't mind if it only happened to me. Anything might happen to anybody. And only Providence to blame, as you might say. But this is something you've done to me. Yes, you, Henry Higgins. Have you found Eliza? Have you lost her? Yes. You have all the luck you have. No, I ain't found her. But you'll find me quick enough now after what you've done to me. But what has my son done to you, Mr. Doolittle? Done to me? He's ruined me, oh. destroyed me happiness, tied me up and delivered me into the hands of middle-class morality. You're drunk, you're raving, you're mad. I gave you five pounds. After that, I had two conversations with you at half a crown an hour. I haven't seen you since. Oh. Drunk am I? Mad am I? Tell me this. Did you or did you not write a letter to some old geezer in America what was giving five millions to found moral reform societies all over the world and wanted you to invent a universal language for him? Oh, that, as a P1 fella, he's dead. Yes, he's dead and I'm done for. And did you or did you not write to him to say that the most original moralist at present in England was, to the best of your knowledge, one Alfred Doolittle, common dustman? After your last visit, I recall making some silly joke of the kind. You may well call it a silly joke. Put the lid on me right enough. Just gave him the chance he wanted to show that Americans is not like us, that they recognise and respect merit in every class of life, however humble. Them words is in his blooming will, in which Henry Higgins, thanks to your silly joking, he leaves me a share in his pre-digested cheese trust worth 3,000 a year on condition that I lecture for his Wannafella Moral Reform League as often as he asks me up to six times a year. The devil he does! <laughs> what a lark! Well, it's the same thing for you, Doolittle. They won't ask you twice. It ain't the lecture in our mind. I'll lecture them blue in the face. It's making a gentleman of me that I object to. Who asked them to make a gentleman of me? I was happy. I was free. I used to touch everyone I wanted for money when I wanted it, same as I touched you, Henry Higgins. Now everyone touches me. The doctors, they used to shove me out of hospital before I could hardly stand on my legs and nothing to pay. Now they find out that I'm not a healthy man and can't live unless they call on me twice a day. 
A year ago, I hadn't a relative in the world, except two or three that wouldn't speak to me. Now I've got 50, and not a decent week's wages among the lot of them. And the next one to touch me will be you, Henry Higgins. Yes, I'll have to learn to speak middle-class language from you instead of speaking proper English. That's where you come in, and I dare say that's what you've done it for. But, uh, my dear Mr. Doolittle, no one can force you to accept this bequest. You can uh, repudiate it. Isn't that so, Colonel Pickering? I believe so. That's the tragedy of it, ma'am. It's easy to say chuck it. But I haven't the nerve. Which of us has? We're all intimidated. Intimidated. That's the word, ma'am. What is there for me if I chuck it but the workhouse in me old age? If I was one of the deserving poor and had put by a bit, then I could chuck it. But as one of the undeserving poor, there's nothing between me and a pauper's uniform but this blasted 3,000 a year which shoves me to the middle class. Oh, pardon the expression, Mum, but you'd use it yourself if you had my provocation. They've got you every way you turn. It's a choice between the, the, the skilly of the workhouse and the charbidis of the middle class. And I ain't the nerve for the workhouse. That's what your son has brought me to. Well, I am very glad you're not going to do anything foolish, Mr. Doolittle. For this solves the problem of Eliza's future. You can provide for her now. Yes, ma'am. I've got to provide for everyone now. Out of the 3,000 a year. Nonsense! He can't provide for her. He shan't provide for her. She doesn't belong to him. I paid him five pounds for her. Do little. Either you're an honest man or you're a rogue. A little of both, Henry, like the rest of us. A little of both. Well, you took the money for the girl and you've no right to take her as well. Henry, don't be absurd. If you want to know where Eliza is, she is upstairs. Upstairs? Then I'll jolly well soon fetch her down. Be quiet, Henry. Sit down. But, Mummy! Sit down, dear, and listen to me. Oh, very well, very well, very well. But I think you might have told us this half an hour ago. Eliza came to me this morning. She told me of the brutal way you two treated her. What? Dear Mrs Higgins, she's been telling you stories. We didn't treat her brutally. We hardly spoke to her. And we parted on particularly good terms. Did you bully her after I went to bed? Just the other way about. She threw my slippers in my face. She behaved in the most outrageous way. I never gave her the slightest provocation. The slippers came bang into my face the moment I entered the room before I uttered the word and used perfectly awful language. Why? What did we do to her? I think I know pretty well what you did. The girl is naturally rather affectionate, I think. Isn't that so, Mr. Doolittle? Very tender-hearted, ma'am. Takes after me. It's just so. She had become attached to both of you. She worked very hard for you, Henry. Well, it seems when the great day of trial arrived and she did this wonderful thing for you without making a single mistake, you two sat there and never said a word to her but talk together of how glad you were it was all over and how bored you'd been with the whole thing. And then you were surprised when she threw your slippers at you. I should have thrown the fire irons at you. All we said is that we were tired and wanted to go to bed, didn't we, Pick? That was all. Quite sure. Absolutely, really, that was all. You didn't thank her or pet her or admire her or tell her how splendid she'd been. But she knew all that. We didn't make speeches, if that's what you mean. Well, I, I suppose we were a, a bit inconsiderate. Oh. Is she very angry? Well, I'm afraid she won't come back to Wimpole Street. Especially now that Mr. Doolittle is able to keep up the position you have thrust on her. But she says she's quite willing to meet you on friendly terms and to let bygones be bygones. Is she, by George? I promise to behave yourself, Henry. I will ask her to come down. If not, go home, for you've taken up quite enough of my time. All right, very well. You behave yourself, Pick. Let us put on our best Sunday manners for this creature that we picked from the mud. Now, now, Henry Higgins, you have some consideration for my feelings as a middle-class man. Remember your promise, Henry. Mr. Doolittle, would you mind stepping outside just for a moment? I don't want Eliza to have the shock of your news until she's made it up with these two gentlemen. Would you mind? As you wish, ma'am. Anything to help Henry keep her off my hands. Ask Miss Doolittle to come down, please. Yes, ma'am. Now, Henry, be good. I am behaving myself perfectly. He's doing his best, Mrs Higgins. Why the devil is that girl? Are we 
having to wait here all morning? How do you do, Professor Higgins? Are you quite well? Quite well. Yes. But of course you are. You're never ill. Colonel Pickering, so glad to see you again. Quite chilly this morning, isn't it? Don't you dare try those tricks on me. I taught them to you and I'm not taken in. Don't be a fool. Get up and come home. Very nicely put indeed, Henry. No woman could resist such an invitation. You let her alone, Mother. Let her speak for herself. You'll jolly soon see whether she has an idea that I haven't put into her head or a word that I haven't put into her mouth. I tell you, I have created this thing out of the squashed cabbage leaves of Covent Garden, and now she pretends to play the fine lady with me. Yes, dear, but you'll sit down, won't you? Will you drop me altogether, now that the experiment's over, Colonel Pickering? Oh, don't you mustn't think of it as an experiment. It shocks me somehow. Oh, I'm only a squashed cabbage leaf. No! <laughs> but I owe so much to you that I should be very unhappy if you forgot me. Really, very kind of you to say so, Miss Doolittle. It's not because you paid for my dresses. I know you are generous to everybody with money. But it was from you that I learnt really nice manners. And that is what makes one a lady, isn't it? You see, it was so, so very difficult for me with the example of Professor Higgins always before me. I was brought up to be just like him. Unable to control myself and using bad language on the slightest provocation. And I should never have known that... Ladies and gentlemen didn't behave like that if you hadn't been there. Well, you were still incredible. He taught you how to speak, and I couldn't have done that, you know. Of course. That is his profession. Damn. It was just like learning to dance in the fashionable way. There was nothing more than that in it. But do you know what began my real education? What? You're calling me Miss Doolittle that day when I first came to Wimpole Street. That was the beginning of self respect for me. And there were a hundred little things that you never noticed because they came naturally to you. Things about standing up and taking off your hat and opening doors. Oh, and... that was nothing. Oh, yes, it was. Things that showed you thought and felt about me as if I was something better than a, than a scullery maid. Although I know you would have been just the same to a scullery maid if she had been let into the drawing room. You never took off your boots in the dining room when I was there. Oh, you mustn't mind Higgins. He takes his boots off all over the place. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm not blaming him. It is his way, isn't it? But it made such a difference to me that you didn't do it. You see, really and truly, apart from the things anyone can pick up, the dressing and the proper way of speaking and so forth, the difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves, but how she's treated. I shall always be a flower girl to Professor Higgins because he always treats me as a flower girl, and he always will. But I know I can be a lady to you because you always treat me as a lady, and you always will. Please don't grind your teeth, Henry. It's really very nice of you, Miss Doolittle. I should like you to call me Eliza now, if you would. Thank you, Eliza, of course. And I should like Professor Higgins... To call me Miss Doolittle. I'll see you damn first. Henry, Henry. Why Henry. don't you slang back at him? Don't stand for it. It'll do him good. I can't. I could have done it once, but I can't go back to it now. Last night, when I was wandering about, a girl spoke to me. And I tried to get back into the old way with her, and it was no use. You told me, you know, that when a child is brought to a foreign country, it picks up the language in a few weeks and forgets its own. Well... I'm a child in your country. I've forgotten my own language and can speak nothing but yours. That's the real break-off with the corner of Tottenham Court Road. And leaving Wimpole Street finishes it. Oh. Oh. But you're, but you're coming back to Wimpole Street, aren't you? I mean... Well, you will forgive, Higgins. Forgive? Well, see, my George. Let her go. Let her see how she can do without us. She will relapse into the gutter in three weeks without me at her elbow. You won't relapse, will you, Eliza? No, never again. I've learnt my lesson. I don't believe I could utter one of the old sounds if I tried. <gasps> oh! Ha, ha, ha! Just so! Meow! 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 Victory! Victory! Can you blame the girl? I don't look at me like that, Liza. It ain't my fault. I've come into some money. 
You must have touched a millionaire this time. I have. Uh, but I'm dressed something special today. I'm going to St George's, Hanover Square. Your stepmother's going to marry me. You're going to let yourself down to marry that low, common woman? He ought to, Eliza. Why did she change her mind? Intimidate you, Governor. Intimidated. Middle-class morality claims his victim. Won't you put on your hat, Liza, and come and see me turned off? Well, if the Colonel says I must, I'll demean myself and get insulted for my pains like enough. Don't be afraid, Liza. She hardly comes to words with anyone now, poor woman. Respectability's broke all the spirit out of her. Be kind to them, Eliza. Make the best of it. Well, just to show there's no ill feeling, I'll be back in a moment. I'm uh, <clears throat> uncommon nervous about the ceremony, Colonel. I wish you'd come and see me through it. See, but you've been through it before, man. You were married to Eliza's mother. Who told you that, Colonel? Well, well nobody told me, but I concluded that naturally... No, you? that ain't the natural way, Colonel. That's only the middle-class way. Don't say a word to Eliza. She don't know. I always had a certain delicacy about telling her. Quite right. We'll leave it like that, if you don't mind. And you come to the church and see me through it? With pleasure, as far as a bachelor can. May I come, Mr. Doolittle? I should be very sorry to miss your... I wedding. should indeed be honoured by your condescension, ma'am. And my poor old woman would take it as a tremendous compliment. She's been feeling very low, thinking of the happy days that are no more. Well, I'll uh, order the carriage and get ready. I shan't be more than 15 minutes. Eliza, I'm coming to the church to see your father married. You had better come with me, and the colonel can go ahead with the bridegroom. Bridegroom, what a word. Before I go, Eliza, do forgive Higgins and come back to us. I don't think Dad would allow me. Would you, Dad? They played you off very cunning, Liza, those two sportsmen. If there had only been one of them, you could have nailed him, see, but there was two. And one of them chaperoned the other, as you might say. It was very artful of you, Colonel, but I'll bear you no malice. I should have done the same myself. So long, Henry. See you in St George's, Liza. Do stay with us, Eliza. <laughs> had a bit of your own back, as you call it. Have you had enough? And are you going to be sensible? Or do you want any more? You want me back, only to pick up your slippers and put up with your tempers and fetch and carry for you. I haven't said that I want you back at all. Oh, indeed. Then what are we talking about? About you, not about me. If you come back, I shall treat you just as I have always treated you. I intend to change my manners. My manners are exactly the same as Colonel Pickering's. That's not true. He treats a flower girl as if she was a duchess. And I treat a duchess as if she was a flower girl. I see. The same to everybody. Just so. Like father. <laughs> Without accepting the comparison at all points, it is true that your father is not a snob and that he will be quite at home in whatever station of life his eccentric destiny may call him. The great secret, Eliza, is not having bad manners or good manners or any particular sort of manners, but having the same manner for all human souls. In short, behaving as though you were in heaven, where there are no third-class carriages, and one soul is as good as another. Amen. You are a born preacher. The question is not whether I treat you badly, but whether you have ever seen me treat anyone else better. I don't care how you treat me. I don't mind your swearing at me. I shouldn't mind a black eye. I've had one before this. But I won't be passed over. Then get out of my way, or I won't stop for you. You talk of me as though I were a motor bus. And so you are a motor bus. All belts and go and no consideration for anyone. 
But I can do without you. Don't think I can't. I know you can. I told you you could. I know you did, you brute. You wanted to get rid of me. Liar! Thank you. You never asked yourself, I suppose, whether I could do without you. Don't you try and get round me. You'll have to do without me. I can do without anybody. I have my own soul, my own spark of divine fire. But... I shall miss you, Eliza. I've learned something from your idiotic notions. I confess that humbly and gratefully. I have grown accustomed to your voice and appearance. I like them rather. Well, you have both of them on your gramophone and in your book of photographs. When you get lonely without me, you can turn the machine on. It's got no feelings to hurt. I can't turn your soul on. Leave me those feelings and you can take away the voice and the appearance. They we are not you. You are a devil. You can twist the heart in a girl as easy as some could twist her arms to hurt her. Mrs. Pierce warned me. Time and again she has wanted to leave you, and you always got round her at the last minute. And you don't care a bit for her. And you don't care a bit for me. I care for life, for humanity. And you are a part of it that has come my way and been built into my house. What more can you or anybody else ask? I won't care for anyone that doesn't care for me. Commercial principles in life are like... Selling violets, isn't it? Don't sneer at me. I have never sneered in my life. Sneering doesn't become either the human soul or the human face. I am expressing my righteous contempt for commercialism. I don't and won't trade in affection. You call me a brute because you couldn't buy a claim on me by fetching my slippers and fetching my spectacles. You were a fool. I think a woman fetching a man's slippers is a disgusting sight. Did I ever fetch your slippers? I think a good deal more of you for throwing them in my face. No, you're slaving for me than saying you want to be cared for. Who cares for a slave? If you come back, come back for the sake of good fellowship, for you'll get nothing else. And if you dare set up your little dog's tricks of fetching and carrying slippers against my creation of a Duchess Eliza, I'll slam the door in your silly face. What did you do it for if you didn't care for me? Why? Because it was my job. You never thought of the trouble it would make for me? Would the world ever have been made if its maker was afraid of making trouble? Making life means making trouble. I'm no preacher. I don't notice things like that. I notice that you don't notice me. Eliza, you're an idiot. I waste the treasures of my Miltonic mind by spreading them before you. Once for all, understand that I go my way and do my work without caring tuppence what happens to either of us. So you can come back or go to the devil which you choose. What am I to come back for? Why, for the fun of it. That's why I took you on. And you may throw me out tomorrow if I don't do everything you want. Me. Yes, or you may walk out tomorrow if I don't do everything you want me to. And live with my step. Yes, or sell flowers. Oh, if only I could go back to my flower basket. I should be independent of both you and father and all the world. Why did you take my independence from me? Why did I give it up? I'm a slave now for all my fine clothes. Not a bit. I can adopt you as my daughter and settle money on if you like. Or would you rather marry Pickering? I wouldn't marry you if you asked me. I don't suppose Pickering would. He's as confirmed an old bachelor as I am. That's not what I want, and don't you think it. I've always had chaps enough wanting me that way. Freddie Hill writes me twice and three times a day. Sheets and sheets. Damn his impudence. He has a right to if he likes, poor lad, and you he does love no me. You have no right to encourage him. Every girl has a right to be loved. What? By fools like that? Freddie is not a fool. And if he's weak and poor and wants me, maybe he'd make me happier than my betters that bully me and don't want me. Can he make anything of you? That's the point. Perhaps I could make something of him. But I never thought of us making anything of one another. You never think of anything else. I only want to be natural. In short, you want me to be as infatuated about you as Freddy, is that it? No, I don't. That's not the sort of feeling I want from you at all. Don't you be too sure of yourself or of me. I could have been a bad girl if I'd liked. I've seen more of some things than you, for all your learning. Girls like me can drag gentlemen down to make love to them easy enough. And they wish each other dead the next minute. Of course they do. Then what in thunder are we quarrelling about? 
I want a little kindness. I know I'm a common, ignorant girl, and you a Brooklyn a gentleman, but I'm not dirt under your feet. What I done, what I did, what I did was not for the dresses and the taxis. I did it because we were pleasant together, and I come, I, I came to care for you, not to want you to make love to me, and not forgetting the difference between us, but more friendly like. Well, of course, that's just how I feel, and how Pickering feels. Eliza, you're a fool. Oh, that's not a proper answer to give me. It's all you get until you stop being a common idiot. If you can't stand the coldness of my sort of life and the strain of it, go back to the gutter. Work till you're more a brute than a human being and then cuddle and squabble and drink till you fall asleep. Oh, it's a fine life, the life of the gutter. It's real, it's warm, it's violent. You can feel it through the thickest skin. You can taste it and smell it without any training or any work, not like science and literature and music and philosophy and art. You find me cold, selfish, unfeeling, don't you? Very well. Be off with you to the sort of people you like. Marry some sentimental hog with plenty of money and a thick pair of lips to kiss you with and a thick pair of boots to kick you with. If you can't appreciate what you've got, you better get what you can appreciate. Oh, you are a cruel tyrant. I can't talk to you. You turn everything against me. I'm always in the wrong. But you know very well all the time you're nothing but a bully. You know I can't go back to the gutter, as you call it, and that I have no real friends in the world except you and the Colonel. And you know I couldn't bear to live with a low common man after you two. And it is wicked and cruel of you to insult me by pretending that I could. You think that I must go back to Wimpole Street because I have no place else to go but father's. But don't you be too sure that you have me under your feet to be trampled on and talked down. I'll marry Freddy, I will, as soon as I'm able to support him. Freddy? A young fool? A poor devil who couldn't get a job as an errand boy, even if he had the guts to try for it. Well, and do you not understand that I have made you a consort for a king? Freddy loves me. That makes him king enough for me. I don't want him to work. He wasn't brought up to it as I was. I'll go and be a teacher. What will you teach in heaven's name? What you taught me. I'll teach phonetics. <laughs> I'll offer myself as an assistant to that hairy-faced Hungarian. What? <laughs> and humbug. <laughs> and toadying ignoramus. Teach him my methods. You dare take one step in his direction and I'll wring your neck. Do you hear? Uh, 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 ring away! What do I get? I knew you'd strike me someday. Aha. Now I know how to deal with you. What a fool I was not to think of it before. You can't take away the knowledge that you gave me. And you said I had a finer ear than you. And I can be civil and kind to people, which is more than you can. Ah, that's done you, Henry Higgins, it has. Now I don't care that for your bullying and your big talk. I'll advertise it in the papers that your duchess is only a flower girl that you taught and that she'll teach anyone to be a duchess just the same in six months for a thousand guineas. Oh, and I think of myself crawling under your feet and being trampled on and called names when all the time I had only to lift up my finger to be as good as you, I could just kick myself. You damn impudent slut, you! But it's better than snivelling. Better than fetching slippers and finding spectacles. By George Eliza, I said I'd make a woman of you, and I have. I like you like this. Yes. You turn round and make up to me now that I'm not afraid of you and can do without you. Of course I do, you silly girl. Five minutes ago, you were a millstone round my neck. Now you're a tower of strength, a consort battleship. You and I and Pickering will be three old bachelors together instead of only two men and a silly girl. Carriage is waiting, Eliza. Are you ready? Quite. Uh, 
Is the professor coming? Certainly not. He can't behave himself in church. He makes remarks out loud all the time about the clergyman's pronunciation. Then I shall not see you again, professor. Goodbye. Bye, dear. Goodbye, Mama. Oh, by the way, Eliza, order a ham and a Stilton cheese, will you? And buy me a pair of reindeer gloves, number eight, and a tie to match that new suit of mine. Number eights are too small for you, if you want them lined with lamb's wool. You have three new ties which you've forgotten in the drawer of your washstand. Colonel Pickering prefers double Gloucester to Stilton, and you don't notice the difference. I telephoned Mrs. Pierce this morning not to forget the ham. What you are to do without me, I cannot imagine. I'm afraid you've spoiled that girl, Henry. I should be uneasy about you and her, as you were less fond of Colonel Pickering. Pickering? Nonsense. She's going to marry Freddy. <laughs> Freddy! <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.